Good morning. I'm David Berto. I'm the Director of Defense Industrial Initiatives here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. CSIS is pleased to welcome you this morning and present to you the launch of an impressive body of work called Fortresses and Icebergs. I want to begin by expressing the regrets of our CEO, Dr. John Hamry, who was scheduled to be your host this morning, uh, but unfortunately is unable to be here. On his behalf, uh, uh, first of all, I extend his regrets, and secondly, I um, welcome all of you to our event this morning. We're here to learn what uh, the two volumes of this book. I, I once had a hearing in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee in which Senator John Glenn said, Mr. Berteau, you have met the bulk requirement. Uh, I will tell you that Jeff Bialos has met the bulk requirement here along with his co-authors. Um, we'll hear uh, a short presentation from Mr. Bialos, and those of you who know him know what a challenge that is for him to do, that is to use the word short uh, in, in uh, the presentation. And because there's so much here, it really is a challenge to uh, condense it. And then we'll hear some commentary from Dr. Jacques Gansler. Uh, and then we'll entertain questions and comments uh, from you here in the audience. I would note uh, for you that this event is being taped, and it, it will be available on our website shortly after we conclude this morning. Uh, I say that so that you will be uh, suitably judicious in your questions and commentary and will comport yourselves as if you know you're going to be on television, unlike most in Washington. Uh, and I also would note for you that copies of the book are available uh, for purchase this morning uh, at a table, I think, out uh, in the foyer, and they're also available uh, at uh, Brookings online. Uh, let me start by making a couple of observations. One is how much we here in our work appreciate the release of these volumes. Uh, they will help our work. We, we have spent countless hours trying to make sense of the data and information from a variety of uh, disparate and inconsistent sources. We publish an annual volume on European defense spending, uh, and, uh, and we're on the verge of releasing our, our 2009 update there. As a result of that, I know how difficult it is to find reliable data, to compare those data across countries and over time, and to reconcile the differences among the ways uh, that data about defense are collected and retained. It's really a tough challenge, and that makes me appreciate uh, the work that Jeff Bialos and Chris Fisher and, and Stuart Cole have done here it makes it all the more impressive, because uh, I know what a, a monumental task it was for them to have undertaken. Uh, I think it also provides a very serious resource for, uh, for ongoing research that we conduct here and that others do as well, uh, which here we combine the results of the work of our defense industry team with our Europe program. I don't know if Heather Connolly is here today. I don't see her out there, but uh, she will probably be down later. So uh, uh, it gives us a much better framework to work. The second observation I would make is that these issues are persistent and important and hard to solve. And you can go back in time. In fact, I look out in the audience, and, and uh, uh, for, for uh, Jack and Jeff, this is a little bit like old home week in terms of uh, many of the folks who were wrestling with these folks uh, on these issues uh, when they were in the Pentagon are, are here today. Um, you know, they faced then three challenges. One is uh, inadequate interoperability amongst the allies, and that requires investment and effort to fix. Uh, the second was declining defense budgets, and the third was reduced competition in industry. Um, the reason those challenges sound familiar to you is, in fact, we sort of seem to be facing them potentially again. One solution, obviously, to some of those challenges was to encourage transatlantic cooperation in defense industry. And we all know there are a lot of barriers to, the, to that uh, expansion, uh, not the least of which is export controls, which is another issue back with us today. So when I look at this book, I see a book that's timely and can help point the way towards greater solutions for those very challenges. And I'll come back to that theme in my closing remarks. Now I would like to uh, lay out our agenda. I'm going to introduce Mr. Bialos. He's going to make his presentation. I'll introduce Dr. Gansler, who will provide some commentary, and as I said, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, Jeff Bialos is the former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Industrial Policy in the Department of Defense. 
He is now a, a partner with Sutherland, Aspill, and Brennan, where he represents a variety of defense issues and defense industries. He's also a fellow with the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies at the Center for Transatlantic Defense Relations. And uh, he's got a computer, he's got a briefing, he's got power. And uh, with that, I'll turn the podium over to Mr. Bialos. Thank you. Make sure I don't fall over anything. Um, thank you all for being here today. And uh, Dave, I'd like to thank you for uh, that very nice introduction. And uh, I think it is only fitting that uh, we release this in the presence of Jack Ganser, at least the spirit of John Hamry. And I see Dave Oliver in the office. These are my colleagues at the Pentagon, uh, really bosses, actually, but colleagues sounds better, uh, 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 who really were the intellectual architects of a whole idea of promoting uh, transatlantic supplier uh, linkages uh, among uh, industries in, in, in European, with European countries uh, in an effort to promote interoperability and uh, uh, also uh, competition in consolidating defense markets. And as Dave really precisely pointed out, here we are a decade later with a similar, somewhat different dynamics, different threat, but a lot of other underlying similarities. And the question is, uh, to what degree this paradigm makes sense today? Uh, and what do you do to promote it? Um, but before we get to the substance of this, I wanted to briefly thank some people here because, uh, as Dave pointed out, this is a, a, a two-volume, 600-plus page, 200-chart effort. And be sure I did not do this alone. So if I can ask Chris Fisher, Stuart Cole, and Krista Mossberg to stand uh, just briefly. These are the colleagues who really are Chris and Stuart were the co-authors, and Krista was an editor and contributor. I really want to appreciate uh, their efforts for this. Uh, second, this grew out of a Defense Department funded study. This is a third of a Defense Department funded study. There are two other pieces that aren't represented, believe it or not, in this book. And I just want to thank my colleagues, Joe Schneider of JSA Partners, who did a piece for the government on industry, which is not part of this, and Dick Weiland, who at the time was with James, who was here somewhere. Um, and uh, Documental Solutions provide the underlying data for this. Uh, so thank you. Um, third, uh, I want to thank the Department of Defense's Office of Industrial uh, Policy. I see Dawn Biermeyer here somewhere in the audience. Uh, and uh, they are the sponsor of this project, and I thank them for their support uh, uh, and help. Um, and uh, Al Volkman is not here today, but those offices were very critical of the ODC around the world because as we did this, we went to every office of defense cooperation in the countries we studied, met with those people, and they were able to review what we did and validate it. I also want to thank briefly the uh, foreign uh, uh, contributors to this volume. In most of the main countries, we had the leading defense industrial analyst in the country either draft the country chapter or review what we did. And so we had a lot of validation from different people. Uh, like most Defense Department funded efforts, this study was uh, uh, over budget and uh, exceeded the schedule. Uh, and uh, fortunately, unfortunately for us, it was a fixed price effort. Uh, uh, fortunately, we had Johns Hopkins as our backer to support us, and I wanted to thank Dan Hamilton, who's here in the audience for, from the Center for Transatlantic Relations, who's standing in the back. Uh, they allowed us to finish this and even exceed our performance goal, goals, again, like most defense programs. Um, uh, and, uh, but um, let me turn to the substance. Uh, and in the short time available, what I want to do briefly is a couple things. One, tell you what we studied. Two, tell you how we studied it because it's a little different. Uh, three, the core themes, and last, briefly, some of the recommendations. Uh, you know, the title uh, is Fortresses and Icebergs. Uh, why is it Fortresses and Icebergs? What we studied here was the two-way street in transatlantic defense market, measuring, trying to measure first the degree of market access for European firms in the United States and vice versa, U.S. firms in Europe. Second, we looked at the evolving European institutions relating to defense and the defense industry. Is there traction there? And what are the implications for the United States? Are there preferences emerging to buy European as distinct from buying national? The fortresses concepts I think most of you can relate to. It's the concept of, you know, is there a fortress America, which historically many would say there has been, and is there now emerging a fortress Europe as distinct from national fortresses? The iceberg concept probably is a little less known to people, and it's the concept, and you can see it there on that little chart from, that's a vintage late 1990s chart from DOD, 
And, you know, what it shows you is the notion of primes on two sides of the ocean, the, the industry side, the supply side, uh, that are not as connected at the top and connected at the bottom to a common supplier base. And so, in effect, the study is looking at demand fortresses, is there fortress-like behavior and supply, uh, you know, to what degree that defense industrial integration has emerged. Uh, I recognize these are caricatures of more complicated realities, but the concepts we thought made sense. So that's what we're studying. Um, what we did, uh, this study uh, fundamentally was designed to try to bring some objectivity to an inherently subjective concept. Uh, a lot of the studies done in this area are pretty soft, and uh, we tried to uh, uh, do this in a way that brought in data and made it as objective as conceivable. Um, briefly, we studied the five major defense subsystem products. We didn't look at space. We didn't look at IT because that's not what our sponsor had within the scope of the study. And so if you looked at those things, which are more commercial in nature, you might get a little different picture. Um, uh, we studied eight countries because we didn't have resources to study them all. Um, and so there are the list of countries, France, Germany, Italy. The LOI 6 minus Spain uh, and two in the east, Romania and Poland, and the United States to do a good cross comparison. Um, and we used data. We had a data set of data from Documental Solutions, uh, which really was all the procurements in the last three calendar years. Now, I would have liked to have a five-year time series and compared it to a five-year time series before, but we just didn't have that. But that said, this is more than most people have had when they've done these studies. So on balance, it's pretty good. But I would say this is art, not science, and this shows tendencies. You know, I, this is not the scientific proof. Um, but uh, the data is, is pretty good among a universe of data, as Dave said. Frankly, the data in this area, when you look at the trade flow data and a lot of the data out there, is not very good. Um, what we did in the study is we really used three methodologies, two to look at market access and one to look at uh, the European Union side. Uh, and the market access, we think of it as uh, uh, one is looking at the barriers to, 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 to market access, sort of input analysis, if you will. What are the factors that, look, uh, that, that, re that, that read on whether you can access a market? And here I drew on my trade law background where we took the classic trade barriers and tailored them to this market. How open and transparent is the competition market in that country? Do they have domestic content rules? Restrictions on foreign defense, uh, uh, foreign investment in defense firms? the role of ITAR, ethics and foreign payments. In each of these areas, we gave each country a score. Uh, in each of these areas, we used data where it was available, and where it wasn't available, we interviewed about 200 market participants, uh, the MOD buyers, the uh, uh, key foreign companies, and the key U.S. companies in, in each market. So we pretty much got everybody. And again, we relied on data. I call this the qualified judgment method, because we relied on data where we had it, where we didn't. We used our own judgment informed by 200 interviews of people. We then looked at outcomes to sort of check our own work and looking at trade flows and volumes. Uh, what, what, what do the trade flows look like transatlantic? Let's look at the outcomes in terms of the footprints of the companies across the Atlantic. Finally, we looked at the EU and we asked a series of more subjective questions focusing on is the European, is European demand developing in defense? Where is that headed? And uh, uh, we also looked at uh, the ultimate question is uh, what are the implications for this for us, meaning is there a preference emerging to, to buy European as distinct from the United States? The ultimate question is sort of the fortress question I outlined. Uh, so that's what we studied. That's how we did it. So what did we find? Uh, what we found, um, and, you know, let me say as I start this, uh, I remember giving a talk on this about 10 years ago in a NATO context. And after I finished, somebody in the audience said, they said, you know, that was a really good speech on transatlantic defense industrial uh, development. And um, I heard pretty much that speech 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, the point of that colloquy is obviously that things change pretty slowly in defense markets uh, because you have long programs with sole source incumbents. But I'm here to tell you that, you know, 10 years later, the change actually is in the air in this marketplace. And the historic norm, which is one of largely closed defense, national defense markets, really is changing. And uh, they, all the markets uh, we studied are transitioning to more open and competitive markets driven by basic core underlying economics and some degree of geopolitics. Uh, the, the drive for innovation to meet 21st century needs, the need for affordability with constrained budgets, 
Uh, all of these are forcing change in a globalizing economy. Um, so what did we find specifically? Uh, if you look at Europe, uh, this, this sort of chart reads left to right, and the blue is the national sole source buying in Europe. And so when you look at the trend line across time, uh, what you see is in the older legacy programs, 85% sole source, today 63 and uh, the chart on the right is uh, new programs initiated in the last three years. You, what do you see? You only see tw roughly 20% sole source. Nearly half of those programs are competed today in Europe. And that is a change, uh, a material change from, from the past when much of Europe was uh, a national uh, sole source. Uh, and, and so you can really see here, uh, really this is in a sense the core of the findings on, on, on Europe. Uh, now, these changes are revolutionary in nature, as I said. When you look at the data, 60% uh, of the spending today is on the old programs. It's on the programs started more than three years ago. Uh, and when you look at the legacy programs, not surprisingly, uh, uh, what you see uh, is a lot of the money went to sole source champions. I have a chart I'm not showing here today where we indexed each country, and it's in the book by sole source champions. You can see in Italy, Finn Mechanica still gets 70 odd percent of the defense budget. In the UK, BAE gets a significant portion, and, and so forth. And, and that is because a lot of the programs are dominated by the old legacy programs that have been around a long time. But change is coming as the world transitions to newer, newer programs. Um, the, 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 the study also shows. Uh, if you look at the track record of buying in these programs, uh, what you see uh, in both the UK and the United States and in the continent is movement toward inter-European buying, either directly or through cooperative programs. Um, and, and the UK already had begun to move in this direction in the 90s. About 25 percent of all UK awards, new UK awards in the years we looked at go to other European suppliers from other countries. Uh, there also is significant movement in this direction in continental Europe as well. Not much U.S. buying on this chart, uh, particularly in the continent, uh, where U.S. won 7 percent of the awards that were competed. Um, this reflects, I think, uh, what we've seen is uh, there are new industrial policies in place in a number of these countries, uh, kind of developing defense industrial policies has been sort of a cottage industry in European MODs in the last couple of years. And what you see there uh, is a tendency toward buying in the European direction. And you do see that in the data and you see that in the policies. So the, the paradox of all this is that, yes, it's a good thing and it's constructive and healthy. European markets are opening and becoming uh, uh, more, more competitive, less sole source buying. The paradox is it's not so good for American companies. Why? A couple of reasons. One, we used to do a lot of our selling sole source. That's moving away. Uh, two, in this new competition, it's just life. There are other robust competitors out there, some European, some Israeli. Uh, three, there is this preference that has emerged to some extent uh, for uh, you know, buying from other Europeans as distinct from us. Um, there are also a couple other factors, and just to touch briefly, ITAR is a big factor, and I'll come back to that. Um, and on the supply side, I think the dynamics also favor buying European as the consolidation has moved forward. Essentially, a European consolidation has moved forward in Europe, and it creates enormous incentives for the buyers to buy from these large European entities that have been created. So our bottom line on this is in the absence of some strategic action by the United States, you know, the, the position of U.S. firms in Europe is likely to, you know, erode over time. There will be occasional buying for exigent needs where we have the only widget, um, but I don't think you're going to see any real growth here in, uh, uh, for the United States. The exception to that uh, is in Central Europe, where what you see here is, unlike the rest of Europe, they ditched all their legacy programs. So the predominant programs in Central Europe is, on, is new, about 90 percent new rather than legacy, which is different than the rest of Europe, or the United States for that matter. And you can see on the right, uh, the United States has won 70 percent of the awards, uh, the new awards in the last couple of years there. Combination of uh, geopolitics and we offer the most attractive financial packages fundamentally is the driver of that. So that's a little different dimension to the overall picture, but the dollars there, of course, are nowhere near the dollars in the rest of Europe. Um, the United States, interestingly, uh, the, the data and the interviews show 
Uh, in contrast to Europe, the United States is trending in a more positive direction for European suppliers. Now, we've always had a history of competitive uh, procurement, but limited competition for the most part, meaning that foreigners were one way or the other excluded, either through a formal mechanism or some informal, uh, you know, uh, uh, type uh, approach. But the data and the uh, uh, available information from you shows that this is changing. And you can see on the left here, in terms of competition, uh, some 41 percent of programs, new programs in the last three years in the United States, in the market areas we looked at were competed. Now, of them, 20 odd percent, 26 percent, I can't read my own number, um, were won by uh, primes where one of the primes was a European firm or the sole prime was a European firm. It tends mostly to be co-primes. So you do see change here uh, in the United States. And the interviews confirm that. Most of the large European country, companies told us that, you know, whereas 10 years ago there would have been no foreign on programs, it's different today. And you could compete if you had a classified facility in the United States. Um, to be sure the U.S. market's hard, all the firms, we must have interviewed 50, 60 firms who compete in the United States, they all told us the same things about what the problems are. Complex market, very robust U.S. competitors, uh, the need for a, a better or a unique widget to compete. Uh, it's so expensive to compete here, you're not going to compete unless you have um, some real opportunity because you know it's going to cost you a lot of money. And the non-invented here syndrome and the institutional resistance to buying uh, foreign, all of them consistently told us that of, among all the market participants we interviewed. Um, so it's not easy, um, but it's better than it was. Um, this is an eye chart, and I know you can't see the data on it, but I wanted to put it up there because this is our, the result of our first methodology where we did a cross comparison of the country on each variable. And what it showed is, and, and this is all in the book, by the way, and there are like 20, cha 20 charts on each of these countries and, and a full explanation of how we arrived at all this data. Um, but what it shows from this is we were able to rank order the markets in Europe uh, based on this analysis. And, uh, you know, here's what the bottom line. Sweden was the most accessible market of the country studied by a, a real margin, no matter how you did it, on an absolute basis, on a comparative basis. We did raw data. We normalized it. didn't much matter, by the way. No matter how you did it, it came out this way. Uh, largely open and competitive procurement market, doesn't have binational rules, no state-owned companies, a lot of foreign investment uh, in the defense industry. And its procurement strategy has shifted over time from a very independent-oriented strategy to a strategy that says, uh, first, we'll upgrade, second, we'll buy off-the-shelf international solutions, we'll only do cooperative development where uh, we can't uh, do it any other, we, we, we can't find something off the shelf. And we'll only do a national program in extremely limited circumstances where it doesn't make sense for some reason or another to do it cooperatively. Italy and Romania come from very different places and fall at the bottom. Uh, it's kind of an odd mix because they're different universes, but there are reasons for both situations. Romania made a lot of strides, has, as I showed you before, uh, a clean procurement slate, gotten rid of the old legacy problems. But their implementation of new rules and competition policies are kind of a work in progress, let's say. And their commitment to, you know, rule of law on these things are also working. Probably they have very high offsets in Romania, and that sort of explains it. Um, Italy is a bit of a paradox, a close ally. Uh, you know, it, it's counterintuitive in a way. We have a strong bilateral relationship with Italy, a lot of cooperation in this field, uh, a good number of Italian purchases uh, over time. Um, but what you see is that uh, the American defense sales to Italy are largely sole source when Italy has a specific need. In contrast, if a U.S. firm seeks to enter the Italian market, it's uphill, it's uphill sledding. And they only really can get there by teaming with a, a company, and for the most part that's been Mechanica. Uh, and the offsets are very high as well. The other countries fall in the middle between them somewhere. The U.K. is the best of the, the, the group in terms of openness, long history of open and competitive procurement. Uh, it's changed, though, some and brought it down because it now balances under a new industrial policy competition with partnership for long sustainment programs. Uh, it's put more emphasis on operational sovereignty, which really signals a desire not to rely on ITAR components. This is our closest ally who is now telling us we want operational sovereignty on major programs. And there's one big program where they told the U.S. Prime, we want U.K. engineers at the top level, no ITAR. All right. 
the U.S. the U.K. also encourages foreign companies under their new policies to essentially do more onshore activities. And so it's really a policy in effect, this onshore thing. It's essentially an offset policy with a velvet glove. Uh, you know, it's not a formal offset, but it's more informal in nature. The United States, I showed you what's happening on the demand side. Uh, what's also happened is European firms have bought in to the U U.S. market uh, in a big way. The U.K. through large acquisitions, the others through a combination of greenfield operations, uh, uh, small acquisitions, and ventures and partnerships with, with U.S. firms. In the bull market of the last five years, European firms have gotten their share. Whether that will continue in the future remains to be seen. Um, France, Poland, and Germany quickly are clustered together, but in different directions. France and Poland in a positive direction. Germany, I would say, uh, status quo would be the charitable way to put it. Uh, France, historically considered a, a, a closed market, is a pretty interesting story. It's, a, it's, a, it's an opening market. They've adopted a bunch of new pro-competitive policies, and while the data doesn't quite show it, all the market participants told us enough for us to feel that there has been open movement um, in their procurement system. There's also the data shows in France a lot of European buying on a cooperative basis. Really, what's happened in France is you have an emerging Eurocentric policy. In effect, Gaulism has sort of transmuted into the neo-Gaulist approach of pan-Europeanism, if you follow that. Uh, and, and that's sort of the new French uh, approach to this. So the French showed us a series of concentric circles. They said, we'd like to buy, if you think of three circles, the, the small circle will buy national. That's like, you know, nuclear bio. A big swath, we'd like to buy European. A small amount, we'd like to compete internationally. Now, when pressed, they'll tell you that, you know, if the economics isn't there to buy European, if the European product just isn't close to being as good or it's much more expensive, then economics will probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, take, the, take it over their aspirations of sort of a more Eurocentric approach. Uh, Germany, on the other hand, shows little evidence of, of movement, a, a lot of national buying. And just to give you the vignette, Germany established a defense industrial pro uh, uh, policy together with its trade association for the industry. And they have a long list of sectors they want to protect and be a leader in, even some sectors where they don't have much today. Now, we asked them about that, and they said, well, this is really for negotiation with the EU, because we expect some of these will fall away, but we wanted to have a long list for negotiating purposes. So you can see this tension in Germany between nationalism and sort of becoming European in approach. Um, what does the study show in terms of which factors were the most significant in markets? Uh, really three. Uh, in the end, governments want to spend money at home, and they find a way to do it. They do it through offsets in smaller countries in Europe. Uh, they do it through more informal and implicit work share uh, in the larger European countries. Uh, and in the United States. Now, in the United States, we have Buy America rules, but they're largely waived for our European allies. And so this is done through implicit and informal mechanisms. And, and companies self-select. They know it's easier if they bring something onshore. They're not even necessarily told to do it. The other thing we found is on the ITAR. Of the 200 people we interviewed, I'd say all but a handful raised that as a significant barrier to transatlantic defense trade. Now, we didn't come here to study ITAR. There have been 40-odd studies. CSIS has done a number. Um, and, you know, but, but in studying the defense industry market, you can't do it without looking at the impact of ITAR. Um, and it's pretty plain uh, from everybody we talk to that Everybody tells us that ITAR slows the speed of obtaining licenses, limits the release of technology, creates business uncertainty, and makes the process very difficult. Fairly or not, European countries are uh, very concerned about their operational autonomy being limited by not having access to technology, by having a black box and not being able to change it during an exigency. Uh, they're worried about program delays and risks and limiting their export flexibility. And we found that the years of talk about design around it really translated uh, into action. Uh, the governments are seeking it in some of the governments explicitly, others implicitly, to use non-ITAR things. The companies uh, at the prime level in Europe are all trying to design out ITAR where they can. Now, they can't always do it, but they will where they can. And European contractors will avoid using ITAR to the detriment of our uh, subsystem suppliers. So, look, maybe not all of these criticisms are probably legitimate, I would say, when you sort of parse through them. And ITAR isn't the root of all evil. 
Uh, there's a legitimate place for export controls in the United States. I don't want to be viewed as uh, not saying otherwise. But the reality is that this is an issue that needs to be looked at, and the Obama administration, fortunately, is doing that. Finally, foreign investment in defense firms, very different postures. The United States, despite sort of the CFIUS process has become more rigorous, has been allowed a lot of foreign investment in this field in recent years. A few of the countries in Europe are pretty open, uh, the UK, for example. Uh, Germany, France, and Italy fairly closed uh, to U.S. defense investment. Now, you don't see our investment there for a number of reasons. One, we don't see a lot, our companies don't see a lot of opportunity there, uh, you know, uh, and there's a whole variety of other reasons, but foreign investment policy is one of it. So that's the first methodology. Briefly on the second one, I'm going to flip a little for time. Um, one, uh, you know, a lot of what we found when we looked at trade flows was consistent with the analysis I just gave you of Europe. Uh, what I want to show you is uh, on the iceberg part of this, what we found is uh, uh, two distinct patterns that have emerged uh, over the years. European firms, uh, you know, have adopted multi-domestic strategies. They want to be at home in multiple countries because their home market is so small and they have to do this to survive. And they all have sought in the U.S. to be at home. And a number of the large ones are now at home in the United States. They have serious amount of sales. A number of them have a billion dollars plus in U.S. defense sales. They have a real on-the-ground presence. And they have classified facilities. Pretty much all the large European firms have classified facilities, which give them a ticket to the dance. The, the U.K. defense firms have $10 billion in U.S. revenues and 73,000 employees here. Um, the U.S., it's a different picture. Why? Because a target-rich environment here and Europe looks hard and small. Hard, small, long gestation periods, uh, risk, fixed price development. The U.S. firms have not, by and large, sought to do significant investments in Europe. So what you see is U.S. firms having modest footprints in the U.K., uh, growing but modest in light of their new U.S. U.K. industrial policy. They want to put more there, but really not much systems capability and very little in the continent. In effect, the U.S. strategy of the large U.S. firms is go for the low-hanging fruit. If you have a good capability, then you can sell it, try it, do it mostly through local agents and partnerships, and that's the pattern that's emerged. So the European part of the iceberg has been more integrated in the United States. The U.S. one, I would say, by and large, has not. Uh, on the EU, uh, what we found on the EU is, is uh, quite interesting. I mean, this is sort of really in defense parlance, people don't think about the EU much. And when we did the study, we went to the EDA, European Defense Agency, and the commission talking about defense, they brought out lots of people. It was sort of like we were the first people to come there from the United States. Uh, you had that sensation in a long time. Um, I would say this, that while NATO is uh, certainly a major part of our security apparatus, it's not the only part going forward. And uh, a role, the EU's role in defense is emerging. The EU, the Europe is coming together in fits and starts in a lumpy period, but they're coming together and developing a defense identity uh, uh, through the European Union. Uh, now, the glass is half empty in this area or half full, depending on your perspective. It's sort of process-oriented. Um, but my own view is this is moving forward. If you look at all the things on this chart Europe is doing and what it means to have a defense identity from having a strategy, having operations, having requirements, they are doing all these things now in nascent form. And the focus is on low-intensity operations, homeland security, and space. Low-intensity, I mean irregular warfare, uh, Petersburg tasks. There is no doubt that the center of gravity emerging in Europe for low-intensity warfare is not through NATO, uh, where the Europeans have essentially not allowed NATO to be involved in the civilian side of these things. It is through the European Union. Uh, and it, that reflects a sort of European appetite for defense. They are comfortable uh, in an environment where there's a lot of, uh, you know, Europe has not been willing to increase its defense budgets material. They've not been willing to do high-level capabilities. Uh, but there is more of a focus on this low-intensity effort. And my own hope is that through the EU, there may be some chance of getting budget increments in the low-intensity field. Um, European uh, involvement in the defense market has grown. There is now a uh, – Europe is developing institutional framework for developing a defense market. All th three major European entities are now involved in the defense marketplace. The Commission, 
which has now put in place two very important directives, both governing defense procurement and developing transfers. Uh, the European Defense Agency, which has code of conduct in place that governs defense sales, and countries have signed up voluntarily to allow more competition in certain defense sales. And the European Court of Justice, which has limited the ability of European countries over time to opt out of the disciplines of the European Union. And so the combination of all this is going to facilitate the movement I showed you before in national defense markets in Europe and accentuate that, with the directives being the most important and central piece of the effort. I mean, it's really a milestone in the Commission's effort to create, uh, uh, you know, regulation of a defense market and to bring the rules, meaning allowing more openness and competition within Europe uh, that have applied in the civil sector to the defense sector. And pretty much everybody we talk to in Europe thinks this is going to be important. And the fundamental reason is because it's now the rule of law. It's now a law. It will be a law at the end of this year and it will have teeth. What's the implication of this for the United States? Um, Generally speaking, this is a good thing, as I said before, all of this, and it's really mostly focused inwardly in Europe. But there's always a mix of motivations when you have many countries involved in why this is happening. And I would say, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, there we go. Uh, I would say that there are some in Europe uh, who have a different motivation for this, not just a, a motivation to, you know, develop their internal market and eliminate redundancies, but to develop an autonomous European defense industrial capability in support of a very European strategy and sort of perceived as a wedge against American hegemony and, and so forth, and to create more balance in transatlantic defense trade. You hear this as you go through parts of Europe and, and, and the Commission. And there are own, some who say, let's get our own house in order with these directives and then we'll be able to negotiate with the United States uh, to rebalance trade and seek reciprocity. Uh, so I think there are mixed of motivations, and, and there is some impulse in that sort of protectionist direction, like there is here, frankly, in the Congress. The new, UE, new EU directives don't contain national preferences that are explicit at all. However, there are implicit preferences on this, and let me leave you with this example. There's a security of supply rubric in these directives that say, uh, you know, buying countries can essentially discriminate against uh, Cust sellers, bidders, on the basis of security supply. So what does that mean? Imagine a circumstance where, uh, let's say, Italy is holding a competition. There is a French prime bidding, which has a European supply chain with export license under this new U EU directive, which are broad and clear and give a lot of certainty, versus they're competing against a Swedish prime with a largely U.S. supply chain, because a lot of Swedish companies do have U.S. supply chains. In that circumstance, the uh, Italians would be allowed under these rules to discriminate against the United the, the Swedish uh, supplier on the basis of ITAR uh, because that imposes more risk. And that's not an unintentional. That's intentional. Now, on one level, you perhaps can't blame people for that. And it is up to the national authority whether to use this or not. But I, I think that sort of poses the issue for you in the implicit way in which uh, you see a sort of preference that could potentially emerge. Now, the United States is going to have to take this into account. We do have defense procurement uh, MOUs with these countries that, look, ought, that essentially call for national treatment, and I'm sure the DOD and I hope will have a dialogue with European firms over this in the future. Let me close by touching on, uh, you know, what do we do about all this? Uh, you know, in the first level, it really depends on do you think transatlantic opening a more open and developing transatlantic arms market is useful from a policy perspective going forward. Um, my own view is yes, even though we're in a different era than the late 90s, uh, I, I think that the defense autarky model, which gave us supremacy in the past, it just doesn't cut it anymore in a world where coalition warfare is very important. Uh, you know, it, it also, in a world where we're in a very consolidated marketplace, we really need competition from foreign sources. And there are a whole range of reasons why I think it still makes sense to do. Um, it's hard to do, but I think, you know, it's really a clean slate, and the Obama administration has to decide whether they want to put effort and time into this. Um, what I would say is that there are a few lessons learned if they want to do it from the past. One is try to do something early in the administration. We did it late, and it's hard to do. It takes a lot of leadership resources from the top because you've got to overcome some powerful institutional resistance to change in this area. 
Second, I wouldn't just do it on the supply side, as we largely did in the late 90s. I would focus on the demand side of the market as well. I think one of the lessons learned is it's nice to form global supply chains, but if you don't have buyers who are open to that kind of demand, it doesn't work well. And third, I think a big lesson for the United States is the EU is here in defense and defense markets, and we need to engage with the EU. We can't hide behind the US, the ESDP NATO conflict to not engage. I, my own view is that hopefully that, that set of issues will get resolved, but in the interim, the United States should engage with the EU in the areas where the EU has competence is involved in defense and defense markets, because there are things we could and should do do there together. Now, I know DOD is saying we're open to it, but I think we ought to go beyond open and engaging with the EU. And finally, I'm, I'm not going to go through this list in detail, but in the book there's a 40-page section on what we ought to do, and here are the sort of, here's the highlight reel. Um, you know, I think the Pentagon has some internal problems in this area. The disconnects between our armaments cooperation, our export controls, uh, you know, and, and, and other elements that relate to this agenda, and we ought to assign one executive to put some of these things together. I think the export control system at the Pentagon is fractured itself. I think we ought to step up armaments cooperation um, in support of coalition warfare and this market development. I think we're going to do it by focusing on the low intensity side and on interoperability rather than focusing on large programs. Um, I, I think we need to do some internal work. I'm glad the Obama administration has taken on the export control agenda. There are other areas besides export controls we need to focus on to make sure we don't live in the cocoon going forward. There are a series of U.S. laws and policies that together each makes sense on its own from immigration to Buy America to uh, export controls to CFIUS. But if you look at the cumulative effect of them, it's sort of tending to build walls, and we need to look at that. And we also need to engage with the EU and all the European countries on these issues of these procurement directives to make sure that preferences is, don't emerge. Uh, and the final two points are, in this study we looked a little bit about the propensity for foreign bribery. And, you know, the U.S. has done a lot in the supply side of that market through the OECD anti-bribery convention. But, you know, it, it is an impediment in defense markets of significance. And we ought to look more at demand side measures in the buying countries because that's where the problem really is. Um, and finally, the thought was maybe we ought to develop a transatlantic defense dialogue modeled after the TABD in the civilian area. Look, let me just sum up by saying this is a hard agenda. There's nothing about this that is easy. And transatlantic, developing an open and competitive transatlantic defense market is really not a panacea. It's just one effort of an overall mosaic. But I think if you look at this together with a lot of other things, it could make a contribution to, uh, you know, arming the coalition and uh, uh, providing it with more affordable and innovative weaponry. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. I would add uh, one other comment to your observation that if the administration is going to try to do something, they should start early rather than late. Um, there are some in this room who had the experience also of don't necessarily assume you have eight years. Um, it's another good reason to start early. Um, I want to welcome our commenter on fortresses and icebergs, Dr. Jacques Gansler. For most of you, of course, he needs no introduction. Uh, I've been learning about defense from him since I came to Washington nearly 30 years ago, and I'm not finished yet, I don't believe. He's a successful engineer, manager, public servant, educator, researcher, and leader. And he has a unique perspective from which to comment on this book and on the issues uh, uh, which it tackles. I would ask you to please join me in welcoming the former Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, Dr. Jacques Gansler. from the military industrial complex. <laughs> Let me uh, point out that I think this book is, is extremely timely and extremely important. Uh, and I think it's important not only for the U.S. national security future, but European national security future. It is full of a lot of critical data. And as Jeff pointed out, that data has largely been absent. Uh, data that would be useful for decision makers, uh, both in government and in industry. A lot of people in industry, I think, will draw on this, but also particularly for policy analysts and the people who are going to be having to address this issue in the coming years in the current administration. 
Uh, one of the things that, that's very important about it is it addresses both sides of the barriers. Uh, clearly, there are import barriers and export barriers, and these exist on both sides of the Atlantic, and this stresses those distinctions, import, export, U.S., Europe. And I think when you get down to it, uh, there's really a, a three-headed challenge that, that hasn't been as widely accepted until people have started suddenly realizing that the EU is the sort of third head here. We've had U.S. bilateral negotiations going on for many years. We've had multilateral negotiations going on with NATO. And now we have both bilateral and multilateral linkages with the European Union nations, and that complicates the issue, but I think it, it's necessary to address it up front. Now, I think there really are four reasons why this transatlantic industrial base issue uh, really matters to U.S. security. First one is just in terms of weapons effectiveness. Today, there is not a single U.S. weapon system not a single one that doesn't have foreign parts in it. And they're selected because they're better, not because they're cheaper. So if we didn't have that, then our basic national security strategy, which over the last 50 years has been technological superiority, if we didn't have these high performance weapon systems using European or Asian or South African even parts, uh, then we would not maintain our technological superiority in many areas. The second uh, area affecting significantly our national security is our mission effectiveness. I can't imagine, and no one has argued with me about this point, that it is, it is inconceivable that any future military operations that the U.S. gets involved with, they're all going to be multinational. You can't address anything from terrorism to insurgents to pirates or whatever you pick on, on a single nation basis. It's going to be, for geopolitical reasons more than even military reasons, a multinational activity. Well, if that's the case, and under coalition operations, then to get maximum force effectiveness, our allies have to have state-of-the-art equipment, and it has to be interoperable with ours. And the best and the easiest, I would argue, way to assure that interoperability and state of the art on both sides, mutual performance, is with transatlantic industrial linkages coming from the supply side, if you will. Third reason, and the obvious one, I think, in this case, and the historic one for the transatlantic industrial linkages is cost effectiveness. Now, here's where the big impact of the next few years is going to occur, because I think everybody universally believes that the dollars available for the U.S. national security are going to be shrinking, whether it's in terms of supplemental disappearing, whether it's the budget leveling out or shrinking. No matter how you look at it, societal demands are going to require the shrinkage of the U.S. defense budget, and as a result, we need to get still higher performance at lower cost. How do we do that? Well, I think one of the main ways we're going to do it is with increased international competition. That means transatlantic industrial teams competing. And industrial linkages, again, are the way to bring this about. And so we've got to move in that direction in order to be cost effective in the future. And lastly, and I think this is probably the one I would emphasize the most, and Jeff just highlighted it as well. I, I tend to disagree with Jeff a little bit in the sense of the trends. I actually think we have a protectionist movement more than we do an openness movement taking place uh, in the U.S. and in Europe. And that is harming our national security. I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. Not that many years ago, the House Armed Services Committee passed through the House the whole House passed a law requiring that every part of every U.S. weapon system must be built in America on U.S. machine tools. Now, we don't have a U.S. machine tool industry much anymore, and the DOD would have had to create one with DOD dollars. And since we utilize foreign parts on our weapon systems because they're better, 
we would have to then have set up expensive new production lines for small quantities of these parts, and they would be lower performing. So now I have to think about, with the smaller quantities of systems that we would buy because they cost more, and the lower performance of the systems, that is not in our national security interest. But that law was passed for the purposes of national security. I just don't see that. Uh, similarly, uh, when recently the Air Force selected a European designed tanker that was going to be built in Alabama, and I think that's still part of the United States to the best of my knowledge, then why was there such crying and screaming taking place in Congress about something that was going to be built in the U.S. and world-class system that won in a competition because of this protectionist direction? So I think it's still there, personally. Now, how do we benefit from globalization? Well, U.S. and Europe have to, as Jeff just pointed out, revise our export control provisions, ITAR, EAR, so forth. They have to change. Similarly, the U.S. and Europe have to change the import rules by American, Barry Amendments, Scott Act, so forth. Uh, What's shocking is when you look at the dates that those laws were written. I mean, 50 years ago in some cases. Now, do any of you think the world is still the same as it was 50 years ago today in terms of globalization? I don't, and I think therefore one has to say, why don't we change? Industry has changed. Industry is globalized. Technology is globalized. Congress isn't globalized. Uh, and there's a saying going around town here that, in fact, Congress is a leading trailing indicator. And, you know, if you think about it, that's probably true. We need to be trying to take a real push from the executive branch direction to show how this is hurting U.S. national security in order to get that change made. It's not going to start from within the Congress, I'm sure, but it is harming U.S. national security for the 21st century. So, if I step back and look at the literature that exists now on culture change, and I think this is a culture change, thinking differently, thinking globalized. It says that in order to benefit from globalization, two things would be required. And this book highlights those two things. First is a widespread recognition of the need for change. If you don't have that, then change isn't going to be able to be sold. And secondly, leadership that has a vision, a strategy, a set of actions, an ability to achieve alignment and motivation to bring about that change. This book provides a lot of the data that's needed and a lot of the policy direction that's required for the change. So I would encourage you. Uh, actually, I'd encourage you, of course, to read the truly outstanding special forward that I wrote. But besides that, I'd suggest you read the book, too, you know, because it does have uh, in its content a lot of very important data uh, that will help, I believe, in moving this change forward. And I think America's future security depends on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gansley. You're now a lot smarter on what this book offers, and if you took very, very good notes, you could probably study for and pass a pop quiz, um, which we're not going to give you. But I think more importantly, you can see that the problems that it illuminates are very much worth the effort of uh, tackling. And you also see some new elements coming into play. And I want, in my closing remarks before we open up to questions, to take opportunity to comment on some of that. The EU is clearly taking action. And the political dynamic in which this action takes place is not only has all the characteristics that, uh, that our two speakers this morning have noted, but it also has an additional one. The deployment of European forces over the past few years into parts of the world in which they actually get shot at and killed has changed the way Europeans are thinking about defense. And where that change leads us, we're not quite sure because, of course, it could lead you in a direction not only of protectionism, but of isolationism. 
uh, our own opinion here is that the geopolitical situation in the world is not going to permit or sustain that, that Europe will, in fact, remain engaged on a global scale, and that European forces will actually deploy into conflict zones uh, and put themselves at risk. This will create a demand because, in fact, the mothers and fathers of the sons and daughters who are put at risk ask legitimately the question, why aren't our men and women as well protected as they can be? And the immediate reaction tends to drive you towards body armor and armored vehicles and that sort of thing. But the reality is, in fact, the very thing we talked about today, the capability to acquire and use data across the spectrum in an interoperable way, in a real-time basis, is in fact the best protection that you can provide forces that are deployed in conflict zones and in harm's way. And that's going to create opportunities for both supply and demand. I think Jeff's focus on, on the demand side of this is very appropriate. Uh, that could reshape the way Europeans both think about what they're going to buy and actually buy it. We heard comments about uh, the potential combined effect of the EU procurement directive and the transfers directive. Now, we know it's one thing for the EU to actually issue a directive. It's another thing to implement it and both the implementation schedule and the fidelity of the implementation, that is, the degree to which it's true to the intent of the directive uh, over history uh, gives us pause that we actually can predict the future uh, here. But they could have a very dramatic effect on the defense market inside Europe. I think one area that, from our perspective, uh, where additional research is clearly called for is the impact of those directives on, first of all, the U.S. subsidiaries of European firms, and secondly, on the European subsidiaries of U.S. firms. Uh, the directives themselves, and in our conversations with those who wrote them, are very imprecise on these points, and, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for an implementation for that to go in one direction or the other. And it may be that that's the greatest opportunity for increased transatlantic defense cooperation. Uh, obviously, the defense budget pressures uh, both here and in Europe are going to continue as well. Uh, one other bellwether worth watching, of course, is the treaties that are, uh, have, have been uh, reinvigorated in their consideration in the U.S. Senate, uh, the U.S.-U.K. Treaty and the U.S.-Australian Treaty. The administration has indicated uh, that they're pushing, they're back on the table. I don't actually see how you can tackle export controls or how you can say you're going to tackle export controls unless you put a lot of effort on, uh, on moving those treaties through in a very timely way. And I would note that it is the end of October. Um, so timeliness is, uh, is perhaps running out. All of these are issues that will demand our attention and our best efforts to address and resolve them. And so I want to commend uh, the authors for this comprehensive work. And I think we all welcome the chance to continue tackling these issues. We'd like now to open the floor for your questions. Uh, we have a procedure. I think we – do we have microphones uh, ready? All right. Um, you raise your hand. Um, Jeff, I think uh, what we'll do is let you recognize folks because uh, presumably you're going to answer these questions. And uh, uh, Jeff will recognize you. You wait for the microphone to arrive and then you actually use it. Um, it would be most helpful to us if you would identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, before you ask your question. Okay. Uh, Jeff, uh, the podium is yours. Honor the board of CSIS. What percentage of Europe's armies today would you say have been re-equipped for out-of-area operations? And if they are not designed to be out-of-area, what are they really designed to do? <laughs> Well, this is a study of defense markets, so I can't say we looked thoroughly at that issue, uh, which is a, not an unimportant one. Um, my sense is there has been an evolution uh, in that direction in Europe. Um, but my, my other kind of you know, I think the notion of fixed forces in Europe has, you know, the notion of expeditionary warfare has entered the European culture. Um, but, but I would say the degree to which European has Europe has operational forces for out-of-area expeditionary warfare. It's pretty limited. It's largely two countries, the UK and France, with a few specialized uh, efforts in, in some of the others. Uh, and it, it, this relates to a point I made before, which was Europe has largely become debellicized, uh, unwarlike. And you see in Europe not much appetite for high-intensity warfare other than two countries. And, you know, you see this in the budgets. 
which are uh, chronically low and shrinking to some degree. You see this in all these capability initiatives in Europe. You know, in a certain sense, we spent years in government, a lot of people in this room, telling Europe to buy more capabilities. But we also tended to focus on the high intensity capabilities. And, you know, the track record is not great there. And I think it reflects that you have a European culture that doesn't have a lot of appetite today for out of area expeditionary warfare and only has pretty limited uh, capabilities, which is why I think we should stop rolling stones uphill. That is to say, the burden sharing we're doing is likely to be a burden sharing where Europe's contribution is going to be more in the low intensity side of the equation and more through the EU. I, Stuart Coles, a colleague of mine, I think might have something to add to that. Stuart, do you have something to add? There is a, a movement in, in a number of countries, on paper at least, to shift from a territorial defense posture to one which is more interventionist and expeditionary oriented, but Jeff is correct. In many ways, the preference there is for the lower end of the conflict, of spec, uh, spectrum of conflict, uh, than to engage in high intensity operations. They're very interested in doing peacekeeping, in stability operations, and reconstruction operations not so much in fighting uh, major wars outside of their own area. Uh, at the same time, they're hindered in their uh, ability to implement this shift that, uh, in policy that they've identified. Germany is a good example where they have a new defense uh, strategy paper out, uh, which tells them that they're going to essentially uh, downshift uh, get rid of a lot of their, their uh, heavy forces which are designed for Europe. But at the same time, they have programs in place for like the MRAV and uh, they have several other armored vehicle programs which are not really connected to that expeditionary. There's some things are driven by uh, domestic politics and industrial policy which is disconnected from the strategy that they've identified. But other countries are moving uh, explicitly into this I will say that there has been uh, one slight change in emphasis, uh, mostly on the eastern borders of Europe, where uh, after the, so the Russian uh, uh, incursion into Georgia, Sweden, Poland, Romania, a number of other countries began re-examining their priorities and indicated that they might be retaining more in the way of territorial defense at the expense of their expeditionary capability. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, uh, at some risk, I'm going to call on Dave Oliver. Dave Oliver, me, ADS, North America. Let's, let me take that, that concept a little bit further. I try to imagine myself as in a European political that's trying to uh, pass money for defense. And, and I'm thinking about how I do this and, and maintain my constituency, et cetera. And I say, if I'm going to do that, then I need to, if, if you, what you say is true, if there's not a, uh, a great wellspring of enthusiasm to go conquer new lands uh, because uh, the Vikings have died off, uh, then, then I must have, uh, then I must have people who believe in the concept, uh, you know, they must believe in the co concept of collateral defense, et cetera. And they are not going to want my peop my soldiers, my men and women, to die in inferior equipment. And so I must outfit them in the best equipment. And I cannot, and I must have jobs, because that's what we have, right? You've you got to have, in the United, you have to have, it must produce jobs for, let's say, Norwegians, if I'm a Norwegian politician, because that's what we use in the United States. It's got to produce jobs for locals because that's how we're, they're going to pay the, the taxes. And I can't have my sons and daughters killed because they wear, have inferior equipment. So I have to have first line equipment for the people I send to do things. 
and it has to come from Norwegian jobs. So I am really worried about how our policies result in Norwegian jobs, in this case, vice buying things from Americans. And so I'm really interested in reading your data because I'm worried right now that the flow of opening up, increasing opening up of Europe and increasing trade is counter to the concepts of peace. I have to think about that one for a while. Put a question mark in at the end. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Look, I think it certainly, you, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, I come back to the notion and it, it's, governments want to spend money at home and governments want superior equipment. I think that's all true. And obviously, in the end of the day, when, you know, uh, I don't think we're going to end up with an open market where there's no European capability. That's, that's unrealistic. Um, you, you know, our policies, you know, I think what you're suggesting is to the degree we push hard on open markets, that's where we end up to some extent. No, no, I'm just worried about it. I'm worried about it. Right. I'm worried right. Going right. To point it's really a tough balance. It, it's a tough balance. I think what you are seeing in Europe, though, uh, you know, th they have more industrial capacity mm -hmm. today than they do demand. And so they're out of balance. Uh, in, in, in aerospace, there's been consolidation to some degree in defense electronics. In the rest of the markets in Europe, there has not been enough consolidation. But one of the things the Europeans have to do to ensure that they can provide the best equipment is to further create some consolidation. Now, hopefully that – I'd like to see that consolidation in a perfect world be more transatlantic in orientation. Um, the realities of the things you mentioned are it may go the other way. I mean, Europe really needs in some sectors last suppers. And one of the things we picked up in the interviews all over Europe, excuse me, is if you look at naval, armored vehicle markets, some of the other things, they all know this is a problem. And they all have to recognize that they're going to have to create some centers of excellence. And that will help to ensure, actually, some future existence of a European, a capable uh, European defense industrial capability that could supply those needs. I worry that what Jack talked about, I think that makes it sound really good. The important point about your argument, though, was that you want the best equipment for both U.S. and European. Given that, and if you accept the fact that the U.S. is not ahead in every area, and in fact in many areas the Europeans are ahead of us, and there are many critical future technologies for which we're not the world's leader. I mean, even quantum computing, pick an, an example. Uh, therefore, we both have to share this world-class technology. Then you get to jobs when you build the stuff after you decide what it is. The tanker example was one of a design as contrasted to where it's built. The jobs is, shouldn't be the deciding factor. It should be the best technology that you can get. And what we need to do is to create transatlantic industrial teams that allow us, whether it's U.S. investment or European investment and where it is, these transatlantic teams then can compete against each other's transatlantic teams in order to get the best capability anywhere and still have it built locally. But it's a technology that's going to drive the performance. Let me add one other thing to that before we go to the next question. I think that uh, one of the fundamental analytical issues that in our minds is probably resolved, but in the minds of DOD is not resolved, is this very question of whether or not we still have the technology lead in the U.S. Uh, as recently as two weeks ago, I heard a fairly senior defense technology official opine in a private setting um, that 95 percent of the future technology we need will still come from the U.S. As long as you have that view, and I, I actually don't believe that to be the case. I think that's a very narrow view of where, what critical technology is and a very uninformed view of from where it's going to come. Um, but as long as that mentality is in place, it's very easy
to fall into a protectionist uh, uh, syndrome at our end, and of course that fosters the same uh, at the other end. The other difficulty is there's clearly benefits that accrue from competition. We all know that. It's been proven over and over again, decade after decade, uh, and yet competition in the future clearly refines competition on a global basis. And so the analytical framework and the policy framework in which we weigh on the one hand the benefits of competition and on the other hand the potential risks, both political and, and substantive, of, uh, of globalization is, a, is an analytical framework that we don't really have our arms fully around yet. Let me, let me, add, one, let me add one more point that I really think is critical here. It's a tough here. question, of course. Yeah, and, and it's because much of the future technology is actually going to come from the commercial world. And, and the kinds of things that we're talking about, net-centric warfare, advanced sensors, whatever, pick, new materials and so forth, they're going to come from the commercial world. They're not going to be U.S. only. In fact, there may be U.S. global corporations that come up with great ideas in China or, or South America or el elsewhere. Where our current barriers, our ITAR barriers particularly, pro prohibit almost uh, commercial firms from wanting to do defense work. That is really dangerous for our future national security because adversaries don't have to deal with ITAR. And as a result, we're putting ourselves behind with our own commercial firms not wanting to do. Boeing got, uh, had to pay a $15 million fine recently because they had a commercial part inside of one of their avionics equipment, I think it was on the 767, that also happened to be in a missile. And therefore, they were violating ITAR by shipping their 767s overseas. I mean, that's foolish. We have, we have just not updated our laws in order to take advantage of worldwide technology. And I think the commercial one is the one that's the hardest hit, not just the military worldwide. Young lady in front. And if everybody can state their name and affiliation. I'm Sheila Ramos with the Project on National Security Reform. Um, building on what uh, Dr. Gansler and Dave Berto just said, uh, it has been our observation that the defense industrial base globally is a subset of the global industrial base. And unless you understand where that is going uh, on a global basis, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily just make sense to look at uh, the Atlantic U.S., uh, European U.S. equation without at least some look at the context within which that exists, including, uh, I think, the whole issue of the erosion of both bases to Asia and how that is going to be influencing how we make all of these decisions, both together, uh, the Europeans and us as our allies, and uh, in other ways. And the issue is, if you don't understand where the commercial base is going, which is in fact the BRIC countries uh, with a huge emphasis on China, uh, I don't know that, I mean, I, I liked what you did, but I don't, I hope you at least put it within the context of the global environment. Absolutely. Uh, I think those of us up here couldn't agree more. I mean, if you look at what are the f shaping forces of the marketplace uh, globally in the last few years, it's the globalization of the economy and it's the information revolution, are two of the underlying shaping forces uh, of what we have. But in the national security area, you also have to look at the threat and the demand, and uh, that's moving too. And globalization has two edges to it here, okay? One edge is as increasingly India and China are online, um, the fact is the United States needs to not live in a cocoon in the defense world. Why? Because we need to get access to the best technology abroad to inform our own competitiveness and our own national security. One of the secrets of the last 50 years is we, we take some of these ideas from abroad in national security and we use them and we improve them and we implement them. And in a world where a lot of the innovation is going to come from abroad in the future, we can't be cut off. Okay. At, the same t at the same time, uh, globalization has its risks. It makes it easy for an agile enemy to get its hands on a missile technology that Hamas or whoever, a non-state actor, can improve and improve. And we do have to operate in a defense world within a community of friends. Uh, 
uh, we can't share with everything. And so I think I agree with your premise completely. You do have to recognize some limitations because we operate in a world where we need to get access and mine a lot of things from abroad, but we need to make sure we're, when we share very sensitive technologies, we have to share it with trusted countries and, and trusted partners. So I would, I would say that. I don't know if you want to say comment. No, I think clearly uh, what Sheila's talking about is, is <laughs> a lot of the software coming from China and India. You know, it's of course, and and we're going to have to accept that and live with it, and that's a major issue in terms of vulnerability, but it's also a major opportunity in terms of getting world class, state of the art stuff, especially because it's commercial. It tends to be built in higher volume, at state of the art, and lower cost. Well, we, that's the direction we have to move. So, we we really want to not have enemies. I mean, and, and, you know, if you think about it, China has terrorists on the Northwest. China has an environmental problem. China has an energy problem. China has a water problem, so forth. We should work on trying to share those problems and solutions with them rather than trying to put out an annual report, the Chinese are coming, we've got to prepare for them, you know, which is what we have been doing. Um, I recently gave a talk to a bunch of Chinese government officials. First question I got is, do you publish an annual report about every country or just us? <laughs> you know, that, that tells you something, you know? Why are we trying to make them into an enemy? Gentleman in the back, you've been waiting a while. Uh, Anthony Skirbo, independent analyst, uh, to follow on to the last question and to touch on your fifth recommendation relative to the uh, illicit foreign payments. Can you briefly inform on the shape, scope, and depth, and the role that uh, competition in the non-transatlantic markets has on the evolving policy relationship on both sides of the Atlantic? Relative to competition in the non-U.S. and non-European markets between the firms, what role that's having on impacting the policy debate on both sides? I'm sorry, do that again. I, I, okay. I, I, I lost the flow of that. I apologize. Uh, competition elsewhere, not in the U.S. and not in Europe, between the European and American firms. What role is that having in terms of shaping the fortresses and the icebergs coming down or just changing their shape. My perception is that the shape is, is not so much that they're coming down or going away, but that they're changing. And this potential move toward protectionism uh, is partly being informed by competition elsewhere, not so much competition to get into the European market or to get into the U.S. market, but how it's being impacted by competition further abroad, the lesser included. Well, yeah, again, I, I think that um, you see two different sorts of strategies being employed. I, as I said before, the Europeans worldwide are looking to make themselves at home in major defense markets. And uh, for them, that means developing more defense presence. Uh, you see that in Australia. You see that in some other places. Um, and for them, that means uh, really, you know, being very much on the ground. Our companies, less so. I mean, uh, exports are a percentage of our uh, companies' work, but it's a much less of a percentage than these European countries, or Israeli countries, for that matter. Uh, there's pretty robust competition in third country markets between us. The worry is it leads to proliferation. You know, the worry is that that that's why, in the, as Jack has said, we'd rather have translated teams competing against each other, and you, you know, you know, it may lead to let them compete here and, and have less uh, proliferating effect. You worry about the effect of the competition abroad in the third countries. What you do worry about is the proliferation implications of, of, of that. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's my shot at it. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Tom Trimble with SAIC. Um, you and your co-authors have mentioned several recommendations, predominantly for government, and underscored the fact that they take several years to implement. Uh, there's one on the bottom there, uh, the transatlantic defense industry dialogue that uh, Dr. Ganslin mentioned also. But are there other, were there in your study, other relatively near-term actions that U.S.-based firms 
might want to take, whether supporting legislation, ITAR related, otherwise, uh, that you think we should be considering? Well, I, I think the, the role, you know, look, I think there, there are two sets of roles for the industry in this. One is to, you know, really push the government for change. Uh, it's our government and it's their governments. And the idea of the transatlantic defense industry dialogue is precisely to create that impetus. The idea, for those who don't know, and I'll flesh it out a little bit, is um, here would be the way it would work, that the leaders of the European and U.S. firms would get together and say, we're going to have a dialogue. And uh, we invite to it the EU, NATO, and maybe the five or six leading arms producing countries, ministries of defense. And we're going to come to you with proposals for change. And they spend six months leading up to it internally with transatlantic groups of companies working on recommendations and developing them and bringing them to government to try to catalyze this and push this. I mean, that's the way the transatlantic business dialogue has worked in the commercial sector. And I think the time has come to catalyze this in, in this sector. But companies can help by working with Congress. Uh, I think companies can shape the help shape the protectionist environment by working with Congress against that. Uh, you know, in some ways. Um, I do think companies then, you know, it, it, you know, the idea here is for government to create a facilitating environment, uh, ultimately, for more transatlantic collaboration. And so it's up to the companies to promote and seek that. A lot of companies today, I think, say, gee, this stuff is hard. You know, it's hard to team with a foreign partner. I mean, you see that a lot. And when U.S. primes look at supply chains and supply chain management, they say, this is difficult. They got to get ITAR licenses and everything. But I, I do think they can push the envelope further and work further within the existing system. Uh, uh, Jeremy again, Northrop Grumman. Thanks, Jeff, for your comment, uh, your report. And I want to build on your last uh, comment because the there is a real challenge with uh, building this uh, collaboration between companies. Um, I see that when I work with a lot with our UK. Um, business and you know there's sort of conventional wisdom that you know the client defense market in the US so companies seek international but you know they're not often necessarily seeking going to Europe because of the challenges that are um, with it they look at the European markets and they say well there's no money there the defense budgets are going down and so the and plus the the, uh, the problems you know with the uncertainty of the defense directives and the industrial strategies and so on they say ah, maybe that's too hard Let's go to simpler markets or where we can do FMS in Middle East and Asia and so on. So um, it seems to me that, the, you know, I'm speaking and supporting your report, that the government really can play a big facilitating role here. And this is why, you know, getting these treaties done uh, between U.S., U.K., U.S., Australia, and other kinds of activities will help create that framework. And a, a, a business dialogue would help as well because if you don't have that, Companies, you know, it's makes it really hard internally to make the case for the investment if, you know, there's not much, you know, juice coming out from the squeeze, so to speak. So, um, you know, the more that we can, as industry, support these kind of efforts, the, the stronger um, we can build this kind of dialogue. But, and one final point is on the, um, the if the European markets or European governments go more and more toward the lower end, that makes it harder again, and in, in for the bigger firms to build that case internally because if they're not buying those big high technology assets uh, or systems, then it, it's harder to, um, harder to justify some of the investments. I, I agree. <laughs> For me to get business development funds for a European project because I don't have any real potential to be the prime. I'm going to be down at the second or third tier, and uh, my margins, my return on investment are relatively small. So unless there's a major opportunity in your tendency is to, again, as Jeff said earlier, go for the low-hanging fruit rather than to make a concerted effort to develop market share and a business presence in Europe. American firms just don't do it. Because from their perspective, Europe is small beer. I, I would just say, look, in the late 90s, when the budgets here were lower, when the governments, particularly the United States government, was actively promoting this, there were much more of this effort at the top level of the U.S. industry to look European in that way. And maybe it will happen again in the next number of years if we do see an absolute uh, decline in budget. Let me uh, check. 
Hello, I'm Manuel Lafont Apnouille. I'm a visiting fellow here at CSIS with the Europe program. Um, first, I, I wanted to say it's always a, a pleasure from when being a European to hear so much nice comment about uh, ESDP and European defense. And yet there is this sort of European ambivalent feeling that you're more often taken seriously when Europe is considered as a market as uh, when it is considered as an operation contributor. But my point is, you mentioned the, the French ideas about the second circle, which was European. And actually, uh, that, that comes from the white paper on defense and national security. And there was a debate at the time, which was limited to some a few people, but there was a debate. And I would map the debate that way. There was some people, but a minority, that did argue for a transatlantic market. That would be either the second circle or a third, more limited, more narrow, but yet existing circle. And, well, obviously, they, they didn't prevail. Then there, there are two kind of, um, let's, let's do a European circle so far. The first approach to this is this is a transition. We need further industrial consolidation, as, as you pointed to. We need to go further on the, the single market uh, uh, integration, um, as you mentioned. And also, um, there are further efforts for uh, European Army's transformation to be done before we can go to that kind of transatlantic market. But there's a transition, and we're aiming at that at, at a later stage. Uh, and the other transitional approach is basically this it has nothing to do with industry or, or economic issues. It's political. It's whether uh, the U.S. is willing to consider Europe in a balanced way on the defense industry market and more broadly on, on the defense and security uh, issues. Uh, and, and obviously being in France, there was a huge talk about the C-17 uh, 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 contract with NATO and, and everything. Uh, and the last uh, part of the map is about the people who do believe that we have two, uh, uh, our agendas are too different. Some people say our security agendas are different, and you mentioned the high-intensity, low-intensity issue. Some people say our economic agenda are different because of the globalization of market and the fact that U.S. Uh, defense firms are looking elsewhere than Europe, as has just been mentioned. A another kind of, of uh, uh, perspective on this, but basically our agendas are too different, so it wouldn't really make sense to go in that direction. How would you map the debate, this discussion here in the U.S. Thank you. Well, thanks, first of all, for the evolution of the, what's going on in France. I think that's uh, very helpful. Uh, I guess you're asking me, what's the, evol what's the debate over the evolution of our defense industrial policy here in the United States? That's, I think that's your question, uh, because you've laid out a series of impulses in France. Well, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I think you have, uh, I mean, I don't think you have a lot of articulated debate, frankly, in the United States on this issue today. Uh, I think if you ask senior Defense Department leaders, they would say we are open to good foreign solutions. And, and uh, you know, I think on the other hand, you have the countervailing tendency Jack pointed out in Congress, uh, especially in di more difficult economic times, uh, to move in their protectionist direction. But I mean, one of the things we haven't had in the last eight or nine years is an articulated uh, defense industrial policy in the United States. We've had ad hoc actions across services, across different parts of the U.S. government. We haven't had that. And I'm hopeful one will now emerge in the next period. Uh, the Obama administration has a lot of things on its agenda, but I think this is certainly one of them. So. I think a key part of that question, though, is trying to define what is a European firm or what is a U.S. firm. I mean, if you think about it, uh, depending upon which day it is, BAE Systems is either owned by a U.S. or owned by a European. If they move the headquarters from London to Paris, does that make them French? If they move it to New York, does it make them U.S., even if they're owned by the U.S.? And it, if you think about the trends in technology and industry, they now are globalized firms and globalized technology. And in terms of taking full advantage of state-of-the-art technologies around the world for our national security, we should be taking advantage of who has that capability 
And then you get into the where it's built question and, you know, the, where the labor force is. Maybe you have some multinational firms that happen to be located in a different location. Uh, but that's not the, the issue. It seems to me that we want to separate here the national security issues of trying to make sure we have the best capabilities in all countries, especially our allies. Uh, and that's the, the principal thing we should be trying to address is interoperability of the equipment, uh, even exercises and training together because we're going to be fighting together and being able to look at then the industrial base that supplies that from a security perspective but also an economic perspective. Those are the broader industrial base strategy questions that I think you're raising, which are the right questions to be addressing. And we need to think about it in the 21st century environment, though, not in the 20th. Uh, one more question. Uh, let's see, uh, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry. Um, Matthew Clarkson from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Um, my question sort of regards um, market changes across the Atlantic. Uh, with um, I, I, what I have in mind, for instance, is uh, the upcoming uh, uh, meeting in Copenhagen. Uh, if uh, the European uh, mindset moves to more sort of a carbon-based economy, at least within the uh, consumer market. And that uh, translates sort of into the de defense sector there. How can that be reconciled within the transatlantic market if, say, for example, America is more reluctant to move in that way? Boy, uh, I haven't really thought about that one, but uh, uh, I, I think what you're saying is uh, uh, how do we, on the one hand, promote an open more open and competitive defense marketplace while we're reluctant to do that in the, in the global warming arena in terms of the carbon-based market, if I understand your question correctly. I'm assuming that culturally we're not as accepting as Europe, but we're sort of not as going to move in that direction. Um, so how do we sort of balance that against what we're trying to do in terms of the about uh, requirements about sort of certain carbon emissions and, and obviously as, as you're aware of um, we spend a, a mass amount of resources and we have a, a moving fuel for example a huge huge operation um, how will how can we reconcile that if uh, if there's this sort of cultural divide between the two sides of the alliance? thanks I'm with my colleague uh, one of my colleagues touch on well, first I'd note that the military has has had uh, a number of green initiatives going on for some time, and uh, in particular looking to move away from uh, petroleum fuels and so on. They're doing it for operational reasons as well as for environmental reasons. But I think the point here can be made much broader, which is uh, how does the emergence of a European regulatory regime affect the potential for uh, Mark, you know, greater cooperation in, in, in arms uh, development and, and the arms industry. And we looked at that, and we found that where they can, the EU does use, can use, and does uh, use uh, regulations in what can be considered a discriminatory factor. There's some potential for that. Um, this is an area where the United States has to be willing to negotiate in a hard way to get some sort of harmonization of requirements and standards. The European Defense Agency is presently developing a handbook of uh, military standards uh, beginning with the NATO STANAGs, which cover all military areas, but they want to extend this into where there are gaps. Uh, they want to develop their own standards, which may be broader or more specific than the standards that the United States adheres to. And so this is an area where we have to attention and where we have to work with uh, Europe in order to harmonize the regulations that we have. Uh, if we don't do that, we could very well find ourselves shut out of certain markets because there is a tendency uh, in the rest of the world where the EU has a major commercial presence to impose EU standards, to adopt EU standards as local standards. The uh, defense, uh, uh, the defense uh, um, uh, procurement directive had in it a hierarchy of standards uh, in which they said, well, first we're going to have uh, international standards, then we're going to have EU standards, and then we're going to have uh, national standards. 
And what's interesting there is that there's no place really shown there for U.S. standards or U.S. US standards or United States standards in there, unless they're adopted and integrated into some sort of uh, regime of European standards. You know, that brings us back to the discussion we had much earlier about the sharing. Because uh, the standards question is a very critical one. If you remember in Kosovo, when the Dutch and U.S. planes are flying along next to each other, they couldn't talk to each other in a secure mode, so our pilots were vulnerable. But those standards both met NATO standards, lowest common denominator, in other words, and that's not the right answer. We need to be able to bring world-class standards into the environment, including the environmental ones, including the energy and so forth. But it strikes me that this is one of the areas that we need to be making some significant steps forward in establishing, so we can have interoperability, establishing world-class standards across not only NATO and EU, but with all of our allies that we're going to be involved with, which goes to your question of what about with India, you know, or what about with other allies that we have uh, that we need to be sharing with. We're going to bring this to a conclusion here. I have a couple of final uh, observation points and, and an additional thank you. Earlier in the, uh, in the discussion, uh, Mr. Bialos thanked those from the Defense Department who had provided support and comfort to him as he and his colleagues uh, in – comfort may not be the word he would have used – but uh, uh, as he and his colleagues engaged on the journey of producing uh, this work here. Uh, I would like to recognize that Brett Lambert, who's arrived, who was not here at the beginning, and uh, extend, I think, the gratitude as well to him because he's in charge of this now. I, I'm not going to put him on the spot and ask him the, to respond to the question about what does the U.S. industrial uh, policy need to be for this uh, administration. But I will tell you that that's clearly a dialogue that needs to be sustained and continued. And we here at CSIS, along with most of you, will continue uh, to engage in and, and foster that dialogue as we go forward. I would also encourage my European colleagues to not leap too fast to the conclusion that everything we do is knowingly connected to everything else we do in an organized and constructive uh, fashion. And it might not be wise to read too much into our uh, approach to an integrated way of dealing with these issues. Uh, it's awful easy to assume that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing when they're not, in fact, connected to the same neural network. Um, Finally, I would point out that I think the ability to take these defense-related issues and translate them into the larger universe of issues that America faces is clearly a daunting task. And I would ask Mr. Bialos if for his next book he would undertake the lessons learned from the transatlantic defense trade for American and European health care reform. And, uh, so <laughs> Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for being here today. Thank you for your attention, thank you for your contributions, and thank you for your continued interest. Fair.